Freedom Church today. So Freedom Church, would you give it up for Brian Holman? Thank you. Well, good morning. I had a Red Bull, so I feel really good right now. So the reason I said that is, uh, you know, we like to joke around a lot um, about crowds. And so the first service, we didn't have as many people, and I was going to make a joke about, it's okay, I'm used to this. I used to pitch in Seattle in the kingdom, but you guys wouldn't have got that joke since you're in Texas. In Seattle, we would have gotten the joke, but it is so great to be here. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Fun day. As a baseball coach, I get to be a father to a lot of knucklehead 14-year-olds that, uh, that I just love them dearly, but uh, they can be a challenge, obviously. But it's so great. Um, you know, baseball is kind of important in our family. My stepfather pitched in the major leagues. I pitched in the major leagues. My brother Brad pitched in the major leagues. My brother Brent pitched Division I college ball. My stepbrother Chad pitched Division I college ball. My nephew pitched Division I college ball. And my son David's in AAA with the Colorado Rockies. So at, at, at Thanksgiving, we don't talk about the Dallas Cowboys. I'm sorry. We talk about baseball. <clears throat> so baseball is kind of important, and you'll kind of hear why as I go through through my message this morning, um, as I started to uh, to speak this morning, I got a text from my daughter. She said, "Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Uh, what you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm getting ready to go go speak in front of this church." She goes, uh, "Well, I'll pray for you. You'll do fine." And I said, "Well, thank you, honey. I appreciate that." And she goes, "P.S. Check your fly." So that's why I was coming up here. If you saw me doing that, that's my daughter looking out for me. So uh, she knows she knows me pretty well, but. Um, I'm happy to be here. We're going to have, we're going to talk about baseball and life. You know, there is no other sport that imitates life more than baseball. So much failure, so many ups and downs. You can have a great inning one minute, the next inning, not so good. Uh, the, uh, baseball is wrought with failure. And, and I hate to tell you this, so is life. There's a lot of failure in life. We're all going to fail. We're all going to struggle. We're all going to go through difficult times. And when we do, go back to the basics. Go back to the simple parts of life. Don't make it complicated. Baseball's a simple game. Life doesn't have to be complicated. You know, um, baseball has permeated my life since I was a little boy. And some great things have happened in my career and some hard things, just like in my life. Some great things have happened and some tragedy and some hard things have happened, and we're going to share about that this morning. Um, in 1993, I was playing for the Seattle Mariners, and I was sitting at home in Seattle. Uh, I had just undergone my third arm operation. I was very frustrated and kind of bitter and kind of angry that, that here I wanted to play so bad, and yet I was on the disabled list. Oh, sorry, they call it the injured list now, but I'm on the disabled list, and uh, the team was down, Seattle Mariners were down playing the Texas Rangers on the road, and I had to stay home, so I wasn't very happy about that. But something magical had just happened in our family. See, my brother Brad had just been called up to the major leagues as well. And not only had he been called to the major leagues, he had been just called up to the Seattle Mariners. So you have two brothers on the same team at the same time in the major leagues, and that just doesn't happen very often in professional baseball. So I'm listening to the game on the radio. We didn't have MLB channel back then, boys. We just had just had ESPN and, and, and the radio. And Dave Niehaus is, is announcing the game, and a friend of mine named Randy Johnson is pitching against the Texas Rangers. And I'm listening to the game, and, you know, Randy's got like 37 strikeouts in five innings or something. So I said, well, I've been there, done that, turn it off. And for you non-baseball people, you can't have 37 strikeouts in five innings. It's kind of funny, and you're supposed to laugh at that, but you didn't. So, <clears throat> but, so I turned off the radio. And I go upstairs to hang out with my kids, and we're up there kind of playing and goofing around, and about an hour later, the phone rings. And as I hear the phone ring, my wife answers the phone, and I hear her gasp, and she drops the phone. And she runs upstairs, and she looked like she'd seen a ghost, scared to death. And I said, honey, what's wrong? She said, Brian, Brad has just been hit in the head with a line drive. See what I mean? He's not even pitching yet. Randy was pitching. She goes, no, Randy threw a ball at some hitter and got kicked out of the game, imagine that, and Brad went in the game, and I ran downstairs and turned on ESPN, and as soon as I turned on ESPN, Chris Berman said, if there is anyone squeamish, do not watch this, and my brother Brad threw a 94-mile-an-hour fastball 
to Mario Diaz, who was the shortstop of the Rangers at the time. And Mario Diaz hit the ball. They clocked it at over 100 miles an hour off his bat. My brother didn't even get a chance to get his glove up, and bam, the ball hit him right in the forehead. It sounded like a gun going off. It was so loud. And the ball bounced from his head all the way in to the Mariner dugout for a ground rule double on the fly. Dropped him like he'd been shot. He hit the mound. He was writhing in pain. He was trying to grab his head, and his hands were shaking uncontrollably. He couldn't grab his head. The trainers came out. The paramedics came out. They put him on a stretcher, and they took him into the training room and then on to the hospital. Now, I'm not going to finish telling you about my story about my brother Brad until the end of my, my story, so you're going to have to listen to everything I have to say, or you're not going to know what happened to him. <laughs> but as my little brother is laying there, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. This one thing, this sport that we lived our whole lives for, that sustained us, that saved us as kids, could possibly be the one thing that could take his life. See, growing up, baseball was our entire life. And growing up in an alcoholic home, and all that that implies, baseball was our saving grace. My dad, unfortunately, was a, was a raging alcoholic and and went through a lot of hard things you know getting evicted from your home and electricity being turned off and having very little food in the house when my dad would go to work he would come home and if he hadn't been drinking my mom would say you know she'd look out the window and say hey it's okay it's okay he's he's all right but if he'd been drinking she'd look out the window and she'd say run to your rooms and we'd go to our rooms at night my brothers and I and my little sister would be all in there listening as they would fight and argue all night long my brothers and I, we'd climb out the window and we'd go to the cul-de-sac under the streetlights and we'd play wiffle ball sometimes till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning just so we wouldn't have to listen to him arguing. My brothers and I grew up very poor. We didn't have, this is going to be a shock to the kids in this room, we didn't have video games. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cable television. In fact, we had three channels on our TV and my brother threw a baseball at me one time and, and missed me. He didn't have very good control. And he hit the TV, broke the clicker. We literally had to get off the couch, go over with a needle nose pair of pliers, and change our three stations. And that's a tough life. But we had brothers, and we had gloves, and bats, and balls, and we played baseball every day. And during the summer, I would have to go to work with my dad because he worked construction, and it was kind of what I did to help the family, and I would go work with him, and He'd always stop at the liquor store and he'd pick up some alcohol and we'd get to the job site and by 12 o'clock, he was pretty intoxicated. By 2 or 3 o'clock, I'm looking at my watch thinking, I got a baseball game coming up. What am I going to do? He can't drive. So I did what every 13-year-old kid would do. I got in the car, started it up, drove across Denver in rush hour traffic, white knuckling it all the way to my baseball game because I had to get to that game. I'd pull in, frantic, frustrated, mad, ready to cry at 13. I'd get out, I'd walk over to the game and there was my coach. He knew what my situation was and he would give me a Gatorade and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He put his arm around me and said, you're safe. Take all that stuff that you got going on right now and you need to channel it into your baseball. And I did, man. I walk on that field, and I played like a kid possessed. Like my hair was on fire every second. I just wanted to beat people so bad. Channel all that in there. Sometimes when you go through hard things, you don't know how it can help you. Growing up, what I did with my dad helped me be a competitor. It helped me never to quit, never to give up, no matter what happened. And as I went through my baseball career in the little league and on into high school I didn't know how good I was going to be but I loved to play and I worked my tail off every day and the next thing I know I was throwing pretty hard by the time I was 18 years old in high school I was throwing 95 miles an hour and the Montreal Expo said you know this guy's got a pretty good arm we think we'll draft him so the Montreal Expos out of all the high school and college players in the United States and Canada that year the Expos picked me in the first round. I was the 16th player picked in the country of all those players. Now, that's not to brag or boast. That's to tell you how dumb the Expos were for picking me 16th pick in the first round. 
The Boston Red Sox had the 19th pick, and they picked some guy out of the University of Texas by the name of Roger Clemens. So they didn't get quite as good a deal as the Red Sox did, but I started my professional career, and I was humbled. In fact, I had no idea. Here I was, a high school All-American, a first-round draft pick. I get into baseball, they're all college high school Americans. They're all high-round draft picks, and they turned my fastball around pretty fast. In fact, my first professional start was in West Palm Beach, Florida. My pitching coach, who had seen me pitch in high school, was now my pitching coach in Florida. And he's, he's, he's talking about to this reporter about this young kid with this great arm. He said, you know, Brian throws hard. He's got a good curveball, good slider. Don't be surprised if this kid throws a no-hitter in his first professional game. And he, they wrote an article. So the next morning I got up, I had to pitch that day, so I get up, I get the paper, and I read the article. About 10 o'clock, I read it again. About noon, I read it for the third time. By 4 o'clock, I probably read this article six or seven times, and I'm thinking, I'm pretty good. I'm going to throw a no-hitter today. So I go out, and I warm up, and I get loose, and I go out and pitch, and you know, I threw a no-hitter in my first professional start. Because I walked the first six out of seven batters I faced. I balked, I threw two wild pitches. I didn't get an out in the first inning, but they didn't get a hit either, so I start my career. And I'll never forget, as I walk off that field, my pitching coach is right there, just like he was when I was a kid. He put his arm around me and said, hey, good news. It can't get any worse than that, so you're going to have to go on. <laughs> his baseball players are kind of funny, so we have to laugh about that. There's so much failure. So I start my career. Three years into my career, I am struggling, man. I am just getting hammered. Frustrating. I'm ready to quit. It's too hard. Well, God brings people into your life, and fortunately, he brought my, my wife into my life, and we started going through the minor leagues together, and it was a tough time because, lo and behold, what I didn't know is she'd also been abused as a young girl. So you have this person who's very bitter and angry. You have me over here who's bitter, very bitter and angry. It was fireworks, like flames to gasoline. A lot of bitterness and anger and frustration. But we always believed if we just got to the major leagues, we would be okay. We worked hard, and that day finally came. 1988, I got the call while I was in AAA that every kid in America wants to get. The Montreal Expos called me and said, hey, Saturday you're going to pitch against the Pirates. I said, the Pittsburgh Pirates? They said, yeah, the Pittsburgh Pirates. I almost threw up right there in the hotel room. I was so excited. The next thing I know, I'm standing in Olympic Stadium in Montreal, Canada. 40,000 crazy French Canadian people are screaming in the stands. And the reason they were screaming, they had those little transistor radios and they were listening to the Montreal Canadiens hockey team. They didn't give a care, they cared about baseball, but they were making a lot of noise and it was exciting. And, and I, I get up and I look in to face my first major league hitter, and it's Barry Bonds. Jose leaned. Andy Van Slyke, Sid Bream, Jay Bell. I mean, these guys just kept coming. Andy Van Slyke could hit. They just kept coming. When I lost my first professional outing, I didn't pitch real great. My next outing, though, was against the Atlanta Braves and a young rookie pitcher by the name of Tom Glavin. And as I'm warming up for this game, let me tell you something, I have electric stuff. My stuff is good. I'm throwing fastballs where I want. My curveballs are good. My slider is good. I cannot wait to get out. And as I get done with my warm-ups, I start to go out. And my pitching coach, who saw me pitch in high school, who was my pitching coach in Florida, is now the major league pitching coach. He has seen this transition from a kid that couldn't throw a ball anywhere near the plate to a major league pitcher. He pulls me aside. He says, I want to ask you some questions. Do you believe you have good stuff? I hope, I think. Do you believe that your stuff is good enough to get major league hitters out? I don't know. I hope so. Do you believe you belong in the major leagues? I don't know. I'm 23 years old. I'm scared to death. And he said, look around you, stupid. Wake up. You just threw a bullpen to a major league catcher in a major league stadium. You're getting ready to walk out on a major league field, stand on a major league mound, and face major league hitters like Ken Griffey Sr. and, and unbelievable Ken Obertfell and, and those kinds of hitters. I'm like, yeah. He goes, 
if you don't start believing that you're a major league pitcher, this is going to be a short rodeo. So change your mindset now and believe that you have what it takes to pitch in the big leagues. I don't know what it was, folks, but something clicked in my mind. And I said, you know, you're right. And I went out through a complete game shutout to beat the Atlanta Braves for my first major league win. Now, I have everything that the world says I'm a success now. I have worked my tail off to get to the big leagues. I have a beautiful wife. I now have a son. I live in a high-rise apartment in Montreal. I got my first big league paycheck. And by the way, the major league minimum in 1988 was $62,500 a year. Today it's $550,000 a year. So my paychecks I thought were amazing, but they really weren't that amazing. But for us, it was incredible. I drive a nice car. Kids want my autograph. And I've got my face on a baseball card. Life doesn't get any better than that. But yet I'm miserable and angry and frustrated that here I had worked so hard to get to this level, hoping that that would be the thing that fixed me, and I'm still broken. I'm still angry. I'm still bitter and still frustrated. My wife is still bitter and angry and frustrated. So by the end of the season in 1988, we pretty much decided that we're going to get divorced. That we can't take this kind of pressure anymore. That we're so bitter and angry about all that life has done and, and did. Let me tell you something about life. What ifs, why nots, how comes, not fairs, why me's are a waste of stinking time. They're a waste of time. I had to get over that stuff. But I, I didn't think I could, we could stay married. So I went on to a road trip, 14-day road trip. We were playing the Mets and the Phillies and whoever else. And while I was gone, my wife had a friend over. And this friend shared the gospel with my wife. And she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior while I was on the road. Now, I came home two weeks later. Usually open the door and she's screaming at me or hitting me with a pan or something crazy. And I opened the door and she threw her arms around me and she hugged me and she kissed me. And she said, I'm so glad you're home. I have so much to tell you. And I said, I don't know who you are, but I'm in the wrong apartment or something. And then she said, I've accepted Jesus in my life. And I literally said, you have lost your mind. I want a divorce. I want nothing to do with this God thing. It's all a bunch of nonsense. My dad hated Christians. He constantly talked about they're hypocritical and they're this and they're that and stay away from it. And I had that mindset. But two weeks into my wife accepting Christ, something had changed. I mean, she looked different in her eyes. You just can't wake up one day from being abused and say, I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't want to be in pain anymore. Something has to change that. I prayed all the time for my dad to wake up and not drink anymore. Something had to change that. October 31st of 1988, Halloween day of all days. I wake up and I'm in a rage. I am angry. I am hating the world. And then my wife announces, hey, honey, we're going to have a little Bible study today at the house. Um, you want to stay and sit in and listen? Mm -hmm, do you? Huh? No, I'm going to the mall. I want to hear nothing about this stuff. As I start to walk out the door, though, something stopped me. And I, in my heart, I, I heard, you need to stay and listen to this. So I stayed. I sat down at the kitchen table. The, the Bible study consisted of me, my wife, and the Montreal Expo's uh, women's Bible study leader, wives' Bible study leader, 75-year-old Winnie Mariner. That was the Bible study, three people. I'd been hoodwinked pulled into this thing I was not happy and I was a jerk and Winnie begins to share with me about the gospel and she starts talking to me unbelievable what she knew about scripture and I was a jerk I started asking her questions I'm Brian Holman I'm a I'm a good guy I'm a major league baseball player why do I need God in my life she said, you know, Brian, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way. You can't beg for it. You can't steal it. You can't buy it. It's a free gift. But you have to accept that gift. I said, okay. I said, well, if the Jews were God's chosen people, why did six million of them die in World War II? What happened to the dinosaurs? Huh, huh? I mean, I'm hammering her with question after question. 
She was so calm. She was so confident. I had never seen anybody as confident in what she believed. Not another Major League Baseball player was more confident than she was. And I literally said, oh my God, this is true. Now what am I going to do? I can't run from it now. I bowed my head and I accepted Jesus Christ in my life of October 31st, 1988. As soon as I did that, I looked up and there was my wife sitting across the table. Crocodile tears of joy streaming down her face all over her open Bible. She was so happy that I was going to be in heaven. Now I'm a Christian. Nothing bad ever happens to Christians. We never go through any hard things now. You know, everything's going to be great. Peaches, you know, perfect life. And um, I make the team out of spring training in 1989. About a month and a half later, me and Randy Johnson get traded to the Seattle Mariners for Mark Langston. I was not happy. I did not want to leave Montreal Expos. I loved them. They were my baseball family. I grew up with them. And now I'm going to Seattle. And I walk in the locker room thinking, man, you got to be kidding me. I'm in the American. I could hit as a pitcher, man. I could rake. And I, I, I can hit now in the American League. I'm kidding. No hitters. Pitchers can hit. But I'm in the American League. And I'm frustrated. Until I saw this 19-year-old kid as my center fielder named Ken Griffey Jr., and then my shortstop was this guy named Omar Vizquel. My third baseman was Edgar Martinez. He could hit a little. Jay Buhner was in right field. Harold Reynolds was at second. Alvin Davis and Tino Martinez were my first baseman. I said, you know, this isn't a bad gig. I'll, I'll stick with this. 1989, I had a, a really good year. 1990, I was named the Seattle Mariner opening day starter. That's a huge honor for a pitcher. My career has taken off. 1990, April 15th, I'm pitching against the World Series champion Oakland A's. And I'm pitching against them in the kingdom, and I'm, I've got great stuff. I am pitching great, and the game's tied one-to-one, -one, going to the eighth inning, and I hang a slider to Mark McGuire, and he hits a two-run home run off me. I lose the game three-to-one. I go back into the locker room, and I look in my locker, and I look at the, the schedule, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. I have to pitch against the Oakland A's again, the next start, but this time in Oakland. They've got Dave Henderson and Ricky Henderson and Carney Lansford and Mark McGuire and Jose Canseco and Terry Stonbach and Walt Weiss and Gary Guy. I mean, they got a pretty good team. They just won the World Series. And so I'm warming up for this game in Oakland. And as I'm warming up, I don't have it. I have nothing like I had in my last game. My fastball's not fast, my change ain't changing, my slider ain't sliding, my curve ain't curving, and I don't know how in the world I'm supposed to get these guys out. In fact, I was so bad warming up that my own relievers were taking bets on how long I was going to last and who the first reliever was going to be in the game that night. Nice teammates. So, what did I do? I went back to the basics and the fundamentals of what I knew in Little League. Fundamentals of baseball. Throw first pitch strikes. Keep the ball down. Throw inside. Work for ground balls. Try to get it out in three, three pitches or less. Don't hang a slider to McGuire Canseco. Hello. And I went out and started pitching. Got through the first inning, second inning, third inning, fourth inning, I'm feeling better. Fifth inning, sixth inning, seventh inning, I strike out Jose Canseco for the third out of the seventh inning. And I go running off the mound and I get in the dugout and whoo, everybody gets away from me. Nobody would look at me. Nobody would talk to me. Nobody would give me a drink of water or a towel, nothing. What's wrong with everybody? Do I smell or something, you know? And then I looked up at the scoreboard, and there were zeros all the way across the scoreboard. And not only had I not given up a hit, not a single Oakland A runner has reached first base. I have a perfect game through seven innings. You know what? I wasn't nervous at all until I looked up at what I could lose. Do you know that's what we do in life all the time? Instead of thinking about what we can gain or what we have or what God has in store, what are we going to lose? We aren't getting our just desserts. I said a prayer. I said, God, this is great. This is so much fun. But I'd like to get a perfect game. <laughs> so I go out for the eighth inning, one, two, three, in the eighth inning. I go back in. Whoop, everybody gets away from me. Nobody look at me. Nobody talk to me. I go back out for the ninth inning. Struck out the first hitter. Next hitter, Walt Weiss, it's a ground ball to Harold Reynolds for an out. I'm one out away 
from a perfect game. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. I'm going to be in the Hall of Fame. They're going to want my hat and my jersey and my jock and my underwear and my spikes and my glove. And they're going to wreck this locker in Cooperstown for all time. And there I'm going to be the 13th player in the history of Major League Baseball to get a perfect game. And then something magical happened. 43,000 people in Oakland Coliseum stood up and began to cheer. And they were cheering for an opposing player. No greater compliment can be paid a player. It sounded like a 747 going off in your ear. The entire place was shaking. I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Greatest adrenaline rush you could have. And then they announced, now batting number 44, Ken Phelps. And I reared back and I threw a fastball. And this knucklehead ruined my no-hitter, my shutout, my perfect game, and my no-hitter in one swing of the bat. He hit a home run off me. Just like that, bam. One pitch away. I'm at the top of the world. And bam, one mistake. You know that's life. That happens in life every day. We're cruising along, everything is great, and a phone call comes, a mistake is made, we do a dumb thing, we don't do a dumb thing, something crazy happens. That's life. At that moment, I wanted to crawl in the fetal position and start crying and sucking my thumb on the mound because I knew I was never going to have a chance to throw a perfect game again, but the next hitter was Ricky Henderson. Struck Ricky Henderson out on four pitches, the game was over. One out away from my Hall of Fame opportunity. I'll never have a chance to be in the Hall of Fame again. Life is that way. In 1990, I was at the top of my career. 91, I had a great season. At the end of my season in 1991, I started having some shoulder problems. I went in to get a simple arthroscopic surgery. The doctor came out, and unfortunately, I had a lot of damage, and they had to do a major reconstruction on my shoulder. 1993, my brother got called up, got hit. 1994, after my fourth arm operation, I'm announcing my retirement in my living room in Bothell, Washington. There was no press conference. There was one television camera. There was one reporter. As I'm announcing my retirement, I'm thinking this is the hardest thing I've ever gone through. Nothing else could be this hard. Little did I know that our family was going to be dealing with some very hard things. Over the next few years, we lost our daughter to leukemia. My son David had a brain tumor. My son Scott got into drugs and alcohol. I had to have open heart surgery to repair a valve in my heart. Craziness. You spend every dime you have trying to save your kids. A year and a half before that, everything was great. And now, bam. When all is going crazy in the world, when all things are falling apart, when you don't know where to turn, you go back to the basics, the fundamentals of what you know. That God's in control, that God loves us, that he died on a cross for us. All of a sudden, remember, life is temporal. It's fleeting. It's but a vapor and it's gone. An eternal life. I've buried two of my children now. There's no worse pain that a parent goes through. My youngest daughter is a nurse at Cook Children's Hospital, as I said. My son David is in AAA with the Colorado Rockies. They're amazing kids. They are today where they are because of the things that they went through as kids. My daughter's a nurse because her sister had leukemia. My son's a baseball player because he refused to quit when he had a brain tumor and he had all these things that were going on. Don't give up on your dreams because hard things happen. Stay focused on the prize. Stay focused on the goal because things are going to happen. It's just inevitable. Failure is inevitable. It's not a matter of if, it's when it happens. And when you fail, it don't mean you're a failure. Life is wrought with failure. So I'm talking to my brother that night in the hospital after he got hit in the head with a line drive. And he starts sharing with me about what it's like to get hit in the head. I'm teasing him, obviously. I'm like, you know, you're much smarter now that you got hit in the head. You know, he's, he's a AAA pitching coach for the uh, Washington Nationals, and he's doing great today. But when he got hit in the head, he starts sharing me with what it was like to get hit. He said, Brian, I throw the ball. And he said, the ball came back at me like, looked like the size of an aspirin. 
It hit me so hard in my head. He said, I literally felt my brain move in my skull. He said, remember when we were kids and dad would say, if you don't knock it off, I'm going to hit you so hard your teeth are going to rattle in your head? He said, it's true. My teeth rattled in my head. He said, then everybody comes out, the paramedics and the doctors and the trainers, and they're talking to me, and it sounded like Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. I couldn't understand a word they said. Then they took me into the training room. And as they set me on the table and they set me up, blood began to pour out of my nose. I had a concussion. I had a detached retina. He had a fractured sinus cavity. But he asked himself three questions. The first question was, if I die today, if this kills me, Will I go to heaven? The third question he had was, will my family know I'm in heaven? And he said, once I realized what I was dealing with, and I asked myself that, do I believe what I believe? Do I know what I know? Was his last question. He said, the peace of God that surpassed all comprehension flooded over him. And without a doubt, he knew that he would be in heaven today. He knew that he knew that he knew. Now, as my little baby brother shared that story with me on the phone, I wept. I wept. Because six months earlier in spring training, after always being mean to my little brother, you know, throwing ice water on him when he's taking a shower and throwing him outside in his underwear when it's snowing and holding him down and poking his chest, the best was holding him down, sucking spit up right before it drops on his face. You know, and it, don't try that, kids. But the bottom line is, you're mean to your little brothers. Six months before that in spring training, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with my little brother and led him in a prayer as he accepted Jesus Christ in his life. He knew that he knew that he knew. Folks, I don't care what investments you make in this world. Jesus gives us the greatest investment advice anybody could give. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know why? The greatest investment you can make are in the lives of people. Because those investments are eternal. And there are not enough zeros to calculate the rate of return when you have an eternal investment return. If I could give you any advice, two things. One, be an encourager. 90% of education is encouragement. I'm a coach. I coach kids every day. Encourage, encourage, encourage. And you will not believe how people will respond to that. Two, be bold for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be bold. Bottom line is the line drives of life are going to come. may not be in the form of a baseball hitting you in the head. But the fact is, is we are all going to die. And when we stand before God and he says, why should I allow you into my heaven? It's not because I was a great baseball player. It's because Jesus is standing beside and he says, because of what I did on the cross, the sacrifice I made and the blood I shed, will he hear, well done, good and faithful servant. It's not about you. It's about what God did in that free gift you need to accept it. Because the worst thing you want to do end of your life, at the end of a game, at the end of the day is look in the mirror and say you know if I only would have done this or if I only would have done that maybe I could be that. Don't do that to yourselves. Be an encourager and be bold for the gospel. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father we're so grateful for this day we're thankful for fathers moms and families I ask and pray Lord that you would help folks here today. There are people in the audience that are struggling Maybe it's physical, maybe it's financial, marriage, whatever. I pray that you would meet them where they are, Lord, that you would open their hearts and their minds to your word and to your grace and to your comfort healing. Pray that you would just meet them where they are on their terms and give them encouragement. We ask and pray that you would take their talents and multiply them for your fame and purpose, Lord. Thank you for loving us and providing for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks. God bless you today. Have a great Father's Day. You know, Brian gave us two challenges. One is to be an encourager. The second, to be bold in your faith for Christ. And Brian, you certainly were an encouragement 
thank you for your boldness in Christ. Thank you for your testimony today. What a powerful, powerful story. I told a, a couple after the first service that one of the things that impacted me so much with your story, and I hope that everybody gets this, is how one, one woman took an opportunity to share the gospel with your wife. And in a small little Bible study, the setup, shared the gospel with you. And I was just trying to picture being in the living room with, here's this 70 year old lady sharing the gospel with this husband and wife. And how from that moment, two lives were forever changed. Now you have the opportunity to share all around the nation. You had an opportunity to pitch all around the nation. But I think of the impact that God has given you because somebody was willing to be bold in their faith and share the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You never know when you're going to have that opportunity. Be bold in your faith. Share Jesus with people afraid to tell somebody that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the answer to the rage and the anger and the frustration. He is the missing part of, of our lives. We need Christ. People need Christ. We just need people bold enough to stand up and share it. Fathers, I hope you will be challenged today to share your faith. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior if you've never accepted Him. If you have, be bold in your faith. This is not a day, this is not a time for men to be quiet. It's not a time for men to be silent. It's not a time for men to sit down and shut up. It's time for men to stand up and be heard. As long as our message is the right message. So I challenge you to accept Brian's challenge. Be an encourager. Be bold in your faith. Would you do me a favor and stand to your feet all over this place? I just want to pray this special prayer over you as we conclude today. But guys, I want you to walk out of this place determined to be an encourager, determined to be bold in your faith. Be an encourager. Be your children's best cheerleader. Be bold in your faith. There's somebody who's in your circle of influence that needs to know that Jesus Christ is the answer to their life. And if you have not found Christ as the answer, then accept Him today. Make Him the Lord of your life today. Father, I pray for every father in this house today, first of all, that here today, on this Father's Day, when we honor fathers, I pray that, Lord, each father in this house would realize that the Father of all fathers has loved us so much that He was willing to send His one and only Son to die on a cross so that we might have everlasting life. Lord, may we accept that beautiful gift that You have made available to each and every one of us. Choose to be changed by the glorious grace of this gift of salvation. I pray for every person in this room today that we would all accept the challenge to be encouragers Lord, there's enough discouragers all around us. There's people around us who are always trying to tear us down and beat us down. Lord, let us be encouragers. But most importantly, let us be bold in our faith. Let us be willing to share the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. Let us be light. Let us be the salt. Let us be the ones that people can find the answer to life. Jesus Christ. We believe that. We are expecting great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Listen, men and, well, men, as you're leaving today, you're going to receive one of these flyers uh, reminding you of the Thrive Conference. And today, today only, if you buy, if you register for the conference, you can get a free one. Just use the code FREEDOM. It's on the sticker there on the top of the conference. But then I also want to remind you guys as you're going out, there are breakfast tacos at the coffee, at the coffee shop available for you. And, uh, 
that's special this today because it's Father's Day. Make sure you pick some of those up on the way out and then stop by the speed pitch radar pitch thing out there. Just don't hurt yourselves. Have fun, but don't hurt yourselves. Hey, may the Lord bless you, keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you great, great peace. God bless you. Yes, man.